Jeff, thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure having you on the on our podcast and uh, our show. And I'd love to get started, uh, dive in uh, for our audience, if you wouldn't mind giving a bit of background, um, you know, who you are, what you've been doing. Sure. Well, thanks. Well, I've been at it for a while, as you might imagine. I actually started as an English professor way back in the day. And then um, Marie and I moved back to California. I joined the tech sector and I had a, a decade of doing sales and marketing positions. Um, I kind of came into my own with it when I joined a marketing consultancy called Regis McKenna back in 1986. And from 86 to 91, that was a place where a lot of the high tech firms were coming to get their strategy and marketing strategy, an incredible crucible to sort of build IP. In. And that's where Crossing the Chasm came out of. Crossing the Chasm let me start my own firm in 91. And then what you, what's interesting about books is you write a book, people get interested, they say, come in, help us out. You come in and help them out and you realize, well, you know, the book isn't completely covering the whole situation here. So you start adding things and things. And pretty soon you think, I have to write another book. And, and so your book, speech, speech, come in, come in, learn, whatever. Seven books later, um, you know, we're at Zone to Win. And that's sort of been my career. And in, the, in, the, in parallel, I, I aligned with a venture firm uh, more David Al Ventures and then Wildcat Ventures today, um, where basically I get to sort of play crossing the chasm, you know, within a portfolio, which is a lot of fun. So just to understand where Zone to Win fits, uh, can you tell us a little bit of background on the other books and then how Zone to Win fits in there? So the original book, Crossing the Chasm, was about how does a startup break into the market with a disruptive innovation? And it, it's, it's about the technology adoption life cycle and how early adopters kind of lean in, but pragmatists hang back and that created this thing called the chasm and how do you cross the chasm and, and whatnot. And that led to a book called Inside the Tornado, which was okay, but the other half of that hanging back is because they're gonna move as a herd. When they move in, they jump in as a herd and that creates something we call the tornado, which is this massive hyper growth that you see with, with tech successes. So how do you play that game? And then there was a third book called The Gorilla Game, which is okay, now as you come to a platform, how do the how do the, the gorilla platforms, whether it's Microsoft or Intel or Oracle or now these days Facebook or Amazon or Apple, how do they come into existence? How do you manage an entire ecosystem? What's the stock market implications of all that? And then when the bubble popped, I ended up saying, okay, we ended up starting working with the incumbent enterprises because uh, frankly, the dot com became the dot bomb and there was the only people left standing. So now that from looking at the same problem of disruptive innovation from the incumbent's point of view, as opposed to from the challenger's point of view. And that led to a book called Dealing with Darwin, which is how to great companies innovate as incumbents. And then to a book called Escape Velocity, where the, where the, the uh, subtitle was Free Your Company's Future from the Pole of the Past. And I kind of thought that was the last book in the, in the sequence. But I, there was a codicil to it, which is, okay, but how do you turn this into an operating model? And zone to win was actually, okay, how would you actually do the escape velocity problem? How would you solve it? Turns out that zone to win is really crossing the chasm from an incumbent's point of view, as opposed to a challenger's point of view. And it's a, it's a, it's a different problem because as the incumbent, you have all kinds of responsibilities and commitments that a challenger doesn't have. And so it, it, it turns out to be organizationally very challenging. And I would say the two books, Crossing the Chasm and Zone to Win Now, are kind of the two books I spend most of my time with. So Crossing the Chasm is for startups, Zone to Win is more for a Microsoft, Salesforce, Tesla, those types or of things. I would say any company that is funding itself out of its own operating income is a Zone to Win candidate. Anybody who's being funded by venture capital is more of a Crossing the Chasm candidate. Okay, perfect. Uh, and what is the goal of the book? Well, it, I think the goal of the book was that previous subtitle, you know, free your company's future from the pull of the past. One of the most frustrating things in tech success is coming to success, enjoying building an ecosystem, doing everything you're supposed to do, and then having some challenger come out of nowhere and redefine your category and you're left going, what happened? So you're like Nokia was the market leader in mobile phones worldwide 10 years ago, and it doesn't exist. It's like, how is that possible? And, and what could we do about that? And there was huge frustration in the incumbent organizations about we're better than this. You know, we can innovate. Why can't we get this done? And what the book with Zone to Win was about was saying, well, here's why you can't get it done. Here's what's going on. And you, you, we teach a playbook for incumbents, but it's a playbook for categories that are not being disrupted. So the, the, my big critique of the MBA playbook is it doesn't include a 
revised playbook for categories that are being disrupted. And that's what Zone to Win was, is intended to provide. Can you give us a high level, an overview of uh, what people will learn when they read the book Zone to Win? What are they going to get out of it in terms of understanding and figuring out how to uh, adapt to disruptive innovation? I think there's kind of two pieces to it. There's a kind of a descriptive piece of kind of like a framework for understanding why the challenge exists and why it's a legitimate that exists. And, and then the second piece of it is, well, what do you do about it? In, in the first piece of it, I think what the zones allow you to do is to realize there are zones of interest inside of an incumbent organization that need different governance models. So there's a performance zone that requires you to sort of make the number and do all the things you've committed to your investors and your customers you're going to do. And, and so then that's very, very, you report out on that every quarter if you're a public company, et cetera, et cetera. There's a productivity zone, which is all the cost center functions that make the performance zone work. So it's all of finance, all of HR, all of IT, security, marketing, customers, anything you don't charge a customer for is probably in the productivity zone. And that's, that's in most years, that's like 90% of your budget are in those two zones. Then there's an incubation zone, which is all about, okay, this is where we're going to test the disruptive uh, things going on in our, in our sector or the disruptive opportunities. But we want to do it outboard of our performance zone, outboard of our productivity zone, because it, it's not ready to scale. It, it shouldn't be encumbered with all the requirements of, of, of a mature business. So we'll we'll create kind of a skunk works thing and we'll do we'll do that. And play that by we have to have a different set of rules there. And then the transformation zone was okay, we are now encountering the disruption, either because we're the disruptor, which is what we call zone offense, or the disrupt T which is what we call zone defense. And in either case, there's kind of a come to Jesus. And so what are we gonna do about this? That turns out to be the most dramatic zone. It does, in, in a good year, it doesn't exist. I mean, it, this is not a happy moment. It's a really, really challenging moment, but it's, it's, it's the defining moment. And so you need to have a playbook for that. And so the, so the descriptive part is just, what zones are we playing our games in? And to honor the fact that each zone has a different management model, different governance model, and that, and that that model is very, very fit for purpose for that zone, but is actually not fit for any of the other three. And so it's incredibly important that the management team in any given year understand which zone are we operating in and therefore which governance model should we be using? Because most of the kerfuffles happen when somebody who works in one zone brings their management model to a challenge that's happening in another zone and they impose the wrong metrics and the wrong standards on that zone. So, so getting that squared away. The prescriptive part is, okay, so where are we in terms of the disruptive wave? And are we you know, ahead of the curve, in the, behind? How, how do we play the game going forward? And uh, just to define a little bit the zones for everyone to understand a little better, can you give me a, a definition of how, uh, what is a zone? I think of it as a um, subset of your company that has a mission. So the performance zone mission is to deliver products and services to your customers and make a financial return. And, and so, and that mission is very easily understood if you're a public company, because it's everything you report out in your earnings call. It's all about the performance. zone. The productivity zone has a different mission. Its mission is to make us more efficient, more effective and, and regulatory compliant. And so between the, the, but those are all three functions which are below the, below the scenes. I mean, the customers don't need, need to experience those, but, but they're, and they're organized around professions not around customers. You'd like to organize the performance zone around your products and your customers, your services and your customers. The productivity zone is organized around disciplines, finance discipline, HR discipline, IT discipline, security, et cetera, et cetera. And so, the, so they have a very professional, functional, almost silo-like management model in the productivity zone, which is very different than the performance zone. Because in the performance zone, you're competing against co uh, other companies. You gotta be pretty, pretty nimble. In the productivity zone, it's more like, no, measure twice, cut once, do it right, do it correctly. So the, the, the cultures in those two zones are, are, are very different. One, one sort of the accelerator culture and the other sort of the braking culture, and that's how you drive a car. The incubation zone is, is, a, is a completely different animal because you can't give it numbers to management by because there aren't it's too soon. We don't know what the numbers ought to be. And you can't say it's supposed to be compliant or effective or efficient. It doesn't even have product market fit yet. It, we don't even know if we're really going to do this for, for real or not. So you want a very venture capital oriented model in the sense, not in terms of financing, but in terms of management model. 
And the one thing I think most incumbent companies do badly, or one thing they do, many companies do badly, is they don't hold the incubation zone accountable to the right metrics. They either hold them accountable to performance zone metrics, which is completely inappropriate, or they don't hold them accountable at all. They just sort of say, well, you're going to innovate and something wonderful will happen. And the, but the venture capital community does neither. They, they don't use performance zone metrics, but they sure as heck hold people accountable. But they hold them accountable to what we call power metrics, not performance metrics. So are you becoming more powerful? Are you, do you Have you gotten new customers that are making you more powerful? Do you have products that are more competitive? You're, you're, you're looking at power metrics, not, not um, uh, performance metrics, and you're held to milestones. Can you get to this milestone by this time? That's how the funding model works in venture capital. And we want to implement a version of that model inside a, a, an established enterprise. Ring fence a fund for the incubation zone, but release it by milestones the way venture capitalists do. So it's a very, you kind of see that's a very different governance model than the other two. I mean, it's just, just different. And those three models I think should be in existence all the time. I mean, every year, I think all of those three zones should be in existence with priority being performance zone first, productivity zone second, incubation zone third. But now if a disruptive innovation raises its head, now all of a sudden the performance zone has got to realize you know, our future is now, there's now an end to our future. I mean, Kodak film is not going to last forever, right? And so we have to figure a way to transition to the new, to the new world. And by the way, we're going to go through what we call a J curve, meaning we're going to, we're going to perform a lot worse before we perform better because we've had a really sweet deal with our existing category. And now we're going to go into a new category where frankly, our customers don't really know we belong there. Our partners don't know we belong there. We're not very good at this new category yet. And so for all those reasons, we have to challenge ourselves to, um, to you know, to, to step up. And so what it requires the company to do is first of all, to understand it's going through a transformation. The only person who can really lead this is the CEO because the CEO is gonna to turn to everybody in the entire company and saying, we are going to reprioritize to privilege the next generation paradigm and to take resources out of our most profitable businesses and put them into our least profitable businesses and do it at scale. And that's a horrible thing to say to people. And your investors, by the way, do not like, like it when you say this. But the fact of the matter is that's how you, you transform. And so the companies that have transformed have had very powerful charismatic leaders like a Steve Jobs or a Bill Gates or a Larry Ellison or you know, Reed Hastings at Netflix or whatever you want to say. And they've done that. But most companies try to say, well, you know, that's too dramatic. I, I, have, you know, I have a bunch of colleagues. We need to be more collaborative. We need to be more consensus driven. And you can't, that doesn't get you through a transformation. And so you see a lot of companies go sideways or frankly go down. Uh, and, and the whole point of Zone to Win was, I don't want that to happen. I, I want existing companies to be able to have a future and, and to continue to serve their customers successfully. And so, but to do that, you have to be able to use this zone framework effectively. And are there any requirements or ingredients for a successful transformation towards that? I think the number one ingredient is you have to have a CEO who is willing to step out and frankly, take a lot of heat and get their board a lot. You have to get the board aligned behind you. You're going you're gonna to have a whole bunch of investors who are going to desert your stock. You can hopefully can recruit a new crop of investors who are interested in your future as opposed to in your past. But that takes a whole new narrative. So part of what you need is a storytelling CEO, is a, a CEO who can inspire people to make sacrifices in the short term. And that, that just, that's not just employees, that's customers, it's partners, it's investors, it's everybody. Because, because they can tell this compelling narrative that says, look, this is the future. And it is in the interest of all of us to get to this future, but we got a tough patch to go through now. And, and so if you don't, it, it can't be, you can't do it at the divisional level because you need the rest of the other divisions to make sacrifices in order to fuel the new division. And you, you know, as, as a peer, you can't ask a peer to say, well, you know, hurt your business to help my business, right? The only person that can do that is the CEO. And so it's, it's, it's a real, that's probably the number one criterion for this. And if you, if you don't, if you're saying, look, Jeffrey, I, that was very eloquent. Thank you very much. You, this is, you didn't describe us. We're not like that. We don't have that kind of culture. Then the second counsel is, okay, then don't transform. What you want to do now is buy time. 
So figure out ways to, 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 to make changes in your performance zone incrementally rather than revolution, but speed up the evolution and understand you're, 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 you're buying time and, and you've got to find some way through this not hole in the future, but not, but not now. Because the worst thing you can do is start a transformation and then three years into it, stop. And that's how you destroy a company. And by the way, we've destroyed, well, the book begins with 56 iconic tech companies that do not exist because they destroyed their company by starting transformations, but not being able to finish them. So when a CEO, if they're not charismatic, they realize they need to transform. They also realize they're not charismatic. Is it by time until you find a new CEO, you have to replace yourself? Let's distinguish between zone offense and zone defense, because zone offense is doing this voluntarily and zone defense is doing this because you've got a gun pointed at your head. Okay, so the zone offense one, absolutely. If you're not charismatic, do not start a zone offense. I mean, just because, because you're, you're actually, people are saying, well, it ain't broke. Why are you fixing it, right? I mean, so what are you doing? Uh, I, I mean, I remember Reed Hastings when they had this incredible DVD business and he was going into streaming and they were just, they were going crazy inside of Netflix, right? But, but, but so if you're a charismatic CEO, you can do it, no. But now let's suppose, you know, I'm just oh, you know, Jeff Moore. I'm an ordinary CEO kind of person. Okay, great. But now you have a gun to your head. So now what you get to say is, okay, look, in order for me to be responsible to my, employees, my investors, my customers, my stakeholders, everybody, we need to have a future and we're under enormous pressure. So you tell a narrative which is much more about crisis and it's much more about getting through a crisis together. You still have to make sacrifices. You still have to make tough decisions. You still have to hold the people accountable to the transformation. But, but, but it's not, you don't have to be as charismatic as you have to just be, you have to be clearly committed and if you're not committed, then yeah, you do have to, then you have to, then you do have to. And by the way, this, that happens a lot, by the way. What will happen to these companies when you have a leader who's that's just not, it's just not what I can do. What happens is they start drifting sideways. They, their stock price starts getting suffering. They, they get marginalized in the industry. And then an Elliott Capital or a Vista or a, a, you know, some, some private equity firm will come in and say, okay, we're going to take over the asset at a substantial discount. And we'll put in a new team. And, and, and that new team, we, we, we will do this. So we're actually getting better at it as an industry than we were 20 years ago. Because 20 years ago, there was no, if you, if you couldn't do it, you, you, you're kind of, you're lost. And is the book primarily for the CEO or is it also for board members, investors, for everybody to understand this transformation? Well, it, it, it's not just up, yes, and it's also for everybody below the CEO. Because if you're in the middle of the organization, you're, you're in one of those zones. You're not, you're not in all four zones. You're in one zone. Although what you can do, but well, there's still, I want to talk about zoning inside your org, but, but staying with the enterprise perspective for a second. Um, so in that world, because you, you say things well, like, why do I have to make sacrifices? And that Yahoo doesn't. I mean, that's not fair, right? And so you have to, well, because you're in the performance zone and they're in the incubation zone. Or I mean, in other words, you really do need to understand zones and honoring zones so that you don't get outraged or whatever. The other thing that we didn't know this as well until the book came out, but one of the things we've learned as the book has been absorbed is you can also zone your own org. You can say, look, I run an org. I have a performance commitment to my enterprise. Okay, that's my performance zone. I have a productivity zone. I have some people inside my org that make my org more productive doing our job. I may even need to incubate some new management model to do you know, IT differently. I'm going to go from on-prem to cloud or I'm going to go to you know, SaaS or whatever it is. Okay, I want to, so you can play the zone model inside, but that's more of a, that's more of a mind trick. That, I mean, the, the, the main idea of the book is, is at the enterprise level. Okay, great. I appreciate that. And for people who want to connect with uh, your ideas more, they buy the book, a website, any other ways to connect with your content? I mean, LinkedIn blog has been a huge uh, success. Uh, uh, Rich Stimber and Jonathan Dipper both helped me a lot with that. And, and so it's a place where, where you can have dialogues around this stuff, uh, but there's, there's, a, there's a web page for Zone to Win and, 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 and certainly you can get resources that way. Uh, there's some videos, if, you know, there's kind of a chalk talk about it. So if you say, well, you know, uh, very nice. It's a short, by the way, it's the shortest book I've ever written. So, you know, that, that's a plus. 
but on the other hand, there's a class of people that don't read books. <laughs> and so there, but there's like 48 minutes, you know, these YouTube videos, which are very helpful for people. Uh, if they want to kind of, kind of a chalk talk about it, so that might be another thing that people could do. I'm going to read the book to learn more about the different zones, but I also want to learn about the different the playbooks, if it's a playbook per zone or if it's an overarching playbook. It's playbook per zone. And, and there's kind of a, a kind of a, how do you orchestrate multiple playbooks? But the playbooks for, and by the way, you'll probably know these playbooks in isolation. So the performance zone playbook is the playbook they teach in every MBA in the world. And, and, bas and basically, it's, you know, how do you make your numbers, I mean, right? And, and it's all about, you know, you know, are you, are you making your revenue commitments? Are you making your bookings commitments? Are you making your gross margins? I mean, it's all that stuff, right? The productivity zone playbooks are all taught in the disciplines. Like if you were a finance major or you were an HR major or you were an IT major, you learn the playbook that runs your function. And so those playbooks are also very familiar. And, 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 but the, and it's not the performance on playbook. You're not trying to make your number in IT, right? You're, you're trying to create your, your, it's typically the, you, you measure the performance zone with ratios. Like, you know, what is my downtime or what is my the lead to book, book to bill, you know, all, all that kind of ratio stuff. The incubation zone playbook is actually well known, but not inside enterprises. It's really well known in the venture community. There is a, I mean, the lean startup and, and all these things, they're, they're, they're very clear about how you run these things. What happens in a, in, a, in, a major, in a corporation, this is a problem, is they try to manage the incubation zone using the systems for the performance and productivity zone, particularly like the annual budgeting process. So in the annual budgeting process, you should not bring any incubation zone effort into the annual budgeting process. What you should do is say, we, are, we know we're gonna fund incubations. We're gonna ring fence a fund for the incubation zone. We're gonna set up a board to govern that fund and release it by milestones. But we're not gonna take, we're not gonna ask people to present in our annual budgeting process, incubation efforts. That's done completely outwards. It's, it's you, and just the way you would pitch a VC group. It is exactly that operating model. People don't do that. And, and, and even when people say they're gonna do it, they actually don't do it. And if you don't do it, you're going to get into trouble because sooner or later you, you need a governance model that's fit for purpose. And that's probably the most common simple mistake that people make with the book. And then transformation, honest to God, transformation is dramatic. It, every, every transformation is unique. So to say there's a playbook for transformation is a little bit presumptuous. The playbook involves like courage, authenticity, service to your customers. I mean, it's, it's a value driven world in which you sort of make it up as you go along because nobody's ever been here before. And, and, and that's, but, but, I, but, but the good news is if you're authentic and you're transformational and you can tell the narrative and the narrative is true, people will lean in more than you think they will. But, but you'll definitely take a lot of heat because, because you're, 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 you're jumping out of a, you know, people like to keep people in their places. If you ever go back to Thanksgiving dinner, you're whatever, you're a teenager again. I mean, it's like, you know, it's like, you, no, you're like this. And it's like, well, actually, 40 years later, I'm somewhat different. No, no, you're like this. Well, customers are that way, investors are that way. So when you try to change your company's trajectory, there's there's definitely inertial resistance. Thank you very much. Thank you for the insights, for sharing, and for being so gracious with your time. It was a pleasure meeting you. Well, Katya, it's a pleasure to be interviewed by you. Thank you.